Greetings, Benazir. How are you, David? Very well indeed, and yourself too, I trust. How is the Pakistan you now see different from the Pakistan you left eight years ago? I do believe Pakistan is under increasing threat of an extremist takeover. And to save the country, I believe we must restore democracy. Benazir Bhutto returns to Pakistan today after eight years in exile, defying warnings of an assassination by Al-Qaeda and vowing to restore democracy to a homeland. I would like to thank all of you who are here and accompanying us on the plane journey back home. This is a very critical moment in Pakistan's history. There is real threat to the life of Mohsarma Benazir. There are credible and corroborated intelligence reports that terrorist groups are out to target Mohsarma Benazir Bhutto. The government is advising her to avoid long public exposures. I am unaware of the details of the security arrangement, but I think the biggest protection comes from God. And God willing, all will go well. You think that Benazir Bhutto will have a third term as Prime Minister of Pakistan? Well, this is up to the people of Pakistan. I've served them before, and it would be a privilege for me and an honor for me to serve them again. We are here just for the Mutama Benazir Bhutto. Are you from Karachi? August 14, 1947, a new nation was born. Pakistan, created by separating the Muslim regions of India from the Hindu. History is made of people rejoice. Independence for India and Pakistan. When the British begin their departure, an era ends and a new era begins. As the new dominions of Pakistan and India take over their own affairs, millions began a journey that over the months was to become the greatest mass migration in history. The country was born in confusion. People who thought they were in Pakistan suddenly realized that they actually were in India. The rapes and brutal mass murders during partition affected both India and Pakistan. Anywhere from 200,000 to a million dead. Many will never reach their new land. More than 60 languages are spoken. The national language became Urdu. But English is the official language. Used in business, government and legal contracts. It is the Muslim faith which holds the nation together. Tension between Hindus and Muslims of India always ran high. When India and Pakistan won their independence, the partition led almost immediately to disputes. Pakistan's very existence depended largely on adequate military strength should the dispute with India assume uncontrollable proportions. The borderland Kashmir has been a disputed territory ever since. The UN succeeds in obtaining a ceasefire. Pakistan has never managed to get control of all of Kashmir. We are making it very clear to both uh, Pakistan and India that war will not serve their interests. More than half of Pakistan's 63-year history has been spent under military rule. A shortage of jobs, of justice, of good school, of electricity and running water are the state's everyday failures. Pakistan has achieved a literacy rate of only 67% for men. 
only 42% for women. Government spending on education is just a small fraction of government spending on the military. Money was pumped into weapons and into Pakistan's religious seminaries or madrasas. For years, theirs has been a radical, ultra-conservative message. Those same madrasas would go on to produce the extreme Islamist Taliban movement. Honor killings, a traditional cultural practice, are widespread and legal. Murder has been condoned by the state in the case of these barbaric killings. The school was closed. 19 people time. were killed in the explosion. More than 50 work. wounded among slide. the dead of these four police officers, often in the front line. The militants' campaign is ferocious and widespread. After 9-11, things changed dramatically. Pakistan, a country with an extensive nuclear arsenal, is facing a very serious security challenge. In 1953, six years after the birth of Pakistan, Benazir Bhutto was born. I was born on June 21st, 1953. My mother says nobody came to see her for three days in the hospital when I was born. It was a wall in morning. So the girl had been born. I remember once she even mentioned to me that even the dogs were giving birth to boys and even the cats were giving birth to boys. Benazir. So my mother never liked that name either. She made me grow up thinking, I want to keep your name Naila. Naila is such a lovely name, Naila is such a pretty name, but they gave this horrible, ugly name, Benazir. Benazir means without compare. B means without. Nazir is like, I guess, vision or com comparison. Basically, it means unique, one of a kind. And boy, did she turn out that way. I am what I am because I'm Zulfikar Ali Bhutto's daughter. Bhutto was the quintessential charismatic personality. He was young, educated. Zulfikar Bhutto was really a man of the world. He went to USC and then he transferred to Berkeley and then he went on to Oxford. And he wanted to be taken seriously on the global stage. Bhutto was appointed to represent Pakistan at the United Nations. He was able to bring Pakistan in the middle of a lot of uh, global discussions. I think Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, what he had that made him so special was incredible eloquence, great belief in himself, and then a serious ability to do backroom deals. Something that is very famous in Pakistan psyche, Bhutto when he came to Washington DC and met with Kennedy, Kennedy told him, Mr. Bhutto, if you were an American, you'll be in my cabinet. Bhutto retorted back saying that, Mr. President, if I was an American, I'll be in your place. Here's a guy who goes to White House and tells an American president that, you know what, I am better than you. He wanted to make sure that when he wasn't in the camera, his crease was fine in his pants, that he always wore the right set of clothes, that he always wore the right cologne. And every young man wanted to copy him. Whatever he wore became a fashion. Very flamboyant. He was the GQ of Pakistan. Zulfikar Ali Bhutto was quoting my aunt, Nusrat. The minute my father saw my mother, who was so absolutely gorgeous, I think he flipped and was love at first sight. I remember my mother being glamorous and well-dressed and, you know, so competent. Nusrat was not only a wife, but a close partner of Mr. Zulfikar Ali Bhutto. She advised him extensively. She was Iranian, and she was more modern than the average Pakistani woman. She famously drove a car when Muslim women were not driving cars at all. The social consciousness of both parents was so powerful that it influenced all the children, not only Benazir, but Shah Nawaz, Sanam, and Murtaza. It was like they were going to leave a legacy behind them so that the children could carry on, could carry forward. There was a reason why they were called the Kennedys of Pakistan.
Zulfikar's father, Shanawaz Bhutto, profited from partition. He received from the new Pakistan a gigantic tract of land, larger than they can imagine, like Los Angeles County. We were landowners, large landowners. My father was telling me, look at the way these people sweat in the heat and in the sun in the fields. It is because of their sweat that you will have the opportunity to be educated. And you have a debt to these people. You've got to come back and pay that debt by serving your people. In a feudal system, everyone is beholden to the master. And this is what Zulfikar Budo, Benazir's father, came from and what he was trying to change so that there could be some progress in Pakistan. He saw that countries that do well economically have to have some kind of a middle class that give the people the opportunity to move upwards. For Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, education was the key for everything, not only for his own children, but for the people of Pakistan, because he knew with education, people will be able to stand on their own feet. They'll be productive members of society, and you can create democracy. It was my father who was against uh, the gender constraints of my time. He enabled me to appreciate that a woman is not a lesser creature. I wore the veil once. When I was 13 years old, it's really like an initiation right into the world of adulthood. I remember when I wore it, it's hot, it's cumbersome, it's long, you trip over it. You can see the world through that black fabric. And it's not a clear world, it's a muted, grayish world. Papa and mommy went to the bedroom. And mommy said, Pinky wore her burqa. I made her wear it for the first time. Then he was quiet for a while, quite thoughtful. Then he just looked up, said there's no need for her to wear it. It was an extremely bold step for him to take, because until that time, no woman from the Bhutto family who reached adulthood had ever gone without burqa. Not too long ago, I sat where you now sit, tramping to class in subarctic temperatures, fighting for books at Hillis Library, cramming for exams. I met her first day of freshman year at Harvard. She was 16, I was 18. She was quiet, she was studious. Uh, she made a small circle of friends, but this was 1969, and six months of her arrival, all the dorms went co-ed. We were in the same dorm. She talked a lot about her own family. We have a lot in common. Benazir comes from a political family. She was very interested in politics, was interested in the world. Not only was she becoming a grown-up, but she was independent for the first time, and her life was under her control, and no one else could control it, not mommy, not daddy, just Benazir. of the Vietnam War, and she saw firsthand the power of the people to uh, change a policy and to bring down a government. She was very much exposed to the ideas of equal rights for women, and, and that was something that, that very much influenced her life. It was the first time that I was in an environment where women were treated as full participants in society. It was that early experience perhaps more than anything else, that shaped my political being. India and Pakistan, of course, have fought numerous wars, but I think none was more bitter than the War of 1971. India dismembered Pakistan, it split East and West Pakistan, East Pakistan becoming Bangladesh. The loss was a humiliation to Pakistan. Not only had their geography changed, but their national sense of self was changed. East Pakistan was a part of Pakistan, made with our own blood and our own sweat. If India thinks that she's rubbing Pakistan nose to the ground 
and that Pakistan can come to a settlement in the way that she's behaving and has behaved in the past, that will then not bring about agreement. There will be endless bloodshed and confusion and chaos. Bhutto was immediately rushed to the United Nations to negotiate peace with India. It was great drama for the UN in its relatively young, young phase. Yesterday, my 11-year-old son telephoned me from Karachi. And he said to me, do not come back. It's a document of surrender. We do not want to see you back in Pakistan if you come like that. We will fight. We'll go back and fight. My country hearkens for me. Why should I waste my time here in the Security Council? You can take your Security Council. Here you are. I'm going. The UN was not going to uh, intervene on the side of Pakistan. Zulfa Kali Buddha made it very clear that Pakistan would not surrender. He didn't come to New York to surrender. That propelled him into a very strong national figure. Bhutto could rally the masses, mesmerize the masses. <laughs> He formed Pakistan People's Party. To form Pakistan People's Party, he had a very simple, very popular slogan, food, clothes, and shelter. People of Pakistan were hurting because of the poverty, lack of education. There was no hope of prosperity. Bhutto just swept the polls. People were waiting for change. People who chanted the meaning of Pakistan is food, clothing, and shelter won the elections with massive majority. He was a leader. Every organization, army, everybody was supporting him throughout. He moved rapidly to make peace with India. Certainly his greatest diplomatic triumph was the Simla Accords. I met Mrs. Gandhi in 1972 when I accompanied my father to Simla. I was wearing my first sari and I was very concerned that I might trip over the sari and it would come undone in front of all the international photographers. I provided the interest in India. So much newspaper coverage, people wanted to do interviews with me. I was quite overwhelmed. And I remember my father called me one morning and said, have you seen these pictures of yourself? You look like Mussolini there. <laughs> Be careful. This was a negotiation in which he didn't have very many cards. After all, India was the victorious power. But using his uh, diplomatic skills, he got a reasonably good bargain, which allowed for the return of some 95,000 Pakistani prisoners of war, reestablished normal relations between the two countries. This was very much a formative experience for Benazir. She watched her father operate. She had a diplomatic role as his hostess, and she absorbed many of his lessons of diplomacy. My father always said, my daughter will make me more proud than Indira made her father. So my father always had the idea that I was a chip off the block. We met when we were both in England, and I was at Cambridge, she was at Oxford. I was struck from the first moment I met her by her force of life. Harvard was a place where she could really be herself. She wasn't in the limelight. At Oxford, there was a large Pakistani community. She was older, and I think she was thinking about her future career. It was assumed that she would not go into politics. She did an interview shortly as she was to leave Oxford. The headline was, no politics for the president's daughter. But at the same time, she had her eye on what was going on. In, in Pakistan. In 1974, India detonated a nuclear explosion. And so now Pakistan faced uh, India that was eight times the size and which had nuclear weapons. Once India got the bomb, the Pakistani military started clamoring telling Bhutto, we want nuclear weapons. Otherwise, how can we compete with the Indians? 
Bhutto made this famous speech, we will build the nuclear bomb, he announced in public, even if we have to eat grass for a thousand years. Bhutto was persuaded by the Ford administration not to go this path. Dr. Kissinger actually was a friend of my father's and respected him greatly, and he tried to warn him as a friend. So he said, I don't want you to be made a horrible example of, and so you should not develop the nuclear device. But that didn't quite work with Zulfikar Ali Bhutto. It was the nuclear power that essentially broke down Zulfikar Ali Bhutto and the West. The whole of the West was very, very anti-Pakistan because they thought we were doing an injustice. It was a bad situation. Like all great charismatic leaders, Bhutto had flaws. He had great strengths, but great weaknesses. And very soon he was in trouble with the establishment, with even the people of Pakistan. His allies became his opponents himself. He started losing traction with everybody who was part of his victory. Her father had chosen to call elections. Zulfiq Ali Bhutto was re-elected. They were contested and a massive agitation started in Pakistan. All this turmoil in Pakistan, protests on the street, big rallies against Pakistan People's Party. He panicked. He didn't do enough to spread Islam in the country, to appease the mullahs, if you will. So he thought he would outflank them by pushing through reforms or demands that they wanted. He made Friday the national holiday, not Sunday. He banned alcohol in the country. His agenda was too wide and too spread out. The large, huge alliance that he had, that pretty much crumbled down. I'm not arrogant. I uh, would hate to be arrogant or to consider myself to be arrogant. But certainly I am intolerant of certain stupid things. When you have power and there's only you and you think you're more intelligent than the rest of the country, that's always a mistake. chief of army staff because he was the least threatening general in Pakistan army. Uh, at least that's what Bhutto thought. My father depended heavily on the reports of inter-services intelligence. So that this choice would make the army very happy. He frog leads Zaya over the heads of five other generals. Zaya was on the face of it very humble. That's the phrase often he used, I am your humble servant. And Bhutto was taken in by this show of deference. And then what had to happen, happened. Mr. Bhutto, the government has been finished. In the entire country, the government has been finished. The government and the Subhai Assembly have been broken. The Subhai Governor and the Vizier have been removed. General Zia ul Haq seized power in April 1977. Basically, there was a general election. Bhutto would have won that election, but his overzealous supporters in the state apparatus rigged that election, which created the atmosphere which permitted the military to come back in with the green light given by the US. Henry Kissinger had said to Bhutto, we will make a horrible example out of you. The charges that were brought against Zulfikar were never proven, they were not warranted. And so this was basically to get rid of him. And then after that, the troubles began for the family. I was in my third year in university. My brothers had to go back to school. My mother and my father said, even if they try and take you off the plane, if they do whatever, don't, under any circumstances, come out of the airplane. Just stay there and go and finish your education. He was concerned particularly for the boys, for their safety. I never knew what was happening to my family. I never knew what was happening to my father. My brother was in Oxford, so 
I used to go and try and visit him. They didn't have that proximity over that last one year, which Benazir had with her father. Week after week, she'd go to jail to see him. And it was during that period she had these very intense conversations with him about leadership and about the people. Once her father was toppled and imprisoned, she now became very engaged, very active. So here we had overnight in another charismatic Bhutto. He gave her the mantle of the party. And in a normal Islamic society, they would give it to the eldest son. But Zulfar Ali Bhutto gave it to the eldest child, the one he thought could best do the job, and it was a woman. It was a huge ongoing struggle for the clearing of her father's name. Then things went from bad to worse. If my father is executed, I honestly do not believe we can talk of Pakistan as it exists today. We cannot talk of a viable country. Pakistan cannot stay united. Pakistan will disintegrate. <laughs> Mir went around the world to lobby leaders to try and save Zulfikar from the executioner's noose. Our message to General Zia is that release my father and hold free election and let the people decide the fate of the country. We have come out against the military regime headed by General Zia al Haq, which we feel is acting in a manner which is prejudicial. We were so isolated and I just used to pretend that it's not going to happen. Zia knew. As long as Sulfikar is alive, Zia can never stay president of the country. What do you think that your father would look back on as his own mistakes? Perhaps choosing General Zia as chief of staff? Father, very intelligent, Coriolanus in Shakespeare, finally falls out with his own supporters weakens and his enemies pounce on him. The whole story of the Bhuttos has strong elements of a Greek tragedy. He called the James superintendent and said, this is the last meeting. And he said, yes. He said, has the date been fixed? He said, yes. He said, for when has it been fixed? He said, tonight. My father said to him, well, make arrangements for me to shave, to have a bath. It's a beautiful earth. And I want to be clean. And he said that tonight I'll be free. My father was very calm. And he talked to family matters. He talked to party matters. And I keep things safe. I said that I'd like to hug my father goodbye. He'd been the president, the prime minister. He brought them back from the camps of India. They wouldn't even open the cell door for me to kiss him goodbye. Said, this is goodbye until the final meeting. And those were the last words he spoke to either my mother or myself. Yes. Well, I don't want to say much. I came just to tell you that uh, what's the personal tragedy. And they've tried to break uh, our father. They've tortured him for two years. They couldn't do that. They tried to ruin his political name, and now they've killed him. We have nothing to be ashamed of. They have buried a martyr today. Zia's rule proved to be the worst period in Pakistan's history. A fear enveloped the country. And many people said, if they can hang Bhutto, who the hell are we? I don't know, after my father's death, I came back to Pakistan and the whole atmosphere changed. I mean, they kept hauling my mother and sister off to different jails. Everything was under martial law. I mean, they had a martial law order that our last name wasn't allowed to be in the newspapers. They turned our home into prison where nobody could enter, where nobody could go out. When you're in detention, it's not the physical aspect which matters, it's the mental. It's having somebody to communicate with. Zia did not want any activity from the family. 
So if the brothers are outside the country and the wife and the daughter is in prison, no activity. Zia was an Islamist. He began a process of Islamicizing Pakistan. General Zia said, we are the true defenders. Israel without Judaism would collapse. Pakistan without Islam would collapse. He imposed Sharia law. Sharia is a divine, utopian, heavenly code of conduct. Sharia on earth means whatever the leader says Sharia means. But of course, the area in which they had the most devastation was in women's rights, what's often referred to as the Hudud laws. The punishment for these crimes is actually mandated by the Quran. There was this notorious law under which if a woman was raped, 